So uh, please join me in welcoming to the stage Carol Bogert, Peter Buchart, and Marcus Bleasdale. I'm going to give them a chance to get seated. And um, as they're taking their seats, I will just briefly introduce them for those who might not know. Um, directly to my right is Peter Buchart, who's the director of the Emergencies Division at Human Rights Watch and an expert in humanitarian crises and humanitarian law and coordinates our responses to events like what you just saw in the clip from Central African Republic. We then have Carol Bogart, who is our Deputy Executive Director for External Relations at Human Rights Watch, formerly Head of the Communications <laughs> Department at Human Rights Watch, and a journalist prior to that, so can speak to many levels of what we're gonna get into tonight. And last but certainly not least, Marcus Bleasdale, uh, leading photojournalist and collaborator with Human Rights Watch for over 10 years now. And dare I say, um, I must mention, recipient of the 2015 Robert Kappa Gold Medal from the Overseas Press Club for this work. <laughs> so, um, so there's sort of two things I want to get into based on this clip, because what people just saw, pardon me, were actually two clips put together. The first is a sort of trailer, which you may have gathered, for those who come to this festival, you probably watch a lot of trailers. And the second clip um, is the first piece of what appears online as part of the feature, the unraveling. Um, but I just want to take a step back for just one minute because one of the things I was thinking about coming here today is sort of how part of the job of the researcher and in this case, photographer, filmmaker, is you have to take in all these events and all this action and these people and emotions and then process it and put it back out in a way that people can comprehend, understand, and ideally react to in some way. And that's a lot. So I just wanna take a step back, and Peter and Marcus, I think this first part is kind of for you. Can you just sort of set the scene for people who may not know Central African Republic so well about when you arrived, what you found physically on the ground, and also a little bit of the political backdrop, because I think it sets up the clip a little bit. And then we'll get into some of the reporting and storytelling questions I have. Yeah, um, I've actually been working in the Central African Republic um, on and off since 2006. And um, in 2013, we learned that there had been another coup in the Central African Republic and that the country had descended into horrific violence. Um, entire villages were being burned by a Muslim group called the Seleka, uh, which had taken power. Um, and we decided to devote a lot of resources to try to draw attention to this brutal crisis. Um, I mean, our first challenge was that nobody really knew the Central African Republic even existed or where it was located. Um, and even though we had to work under very difficult conditions, as you see in the video, um, everything was destroyed. We had to sleep by the side of our car, take all of our supplies with us. Um, and we saw horrific violence um, unfold in front of us. Really, the biggest challenge we faced was getting people to care about what was happening in the Central African Republic and ultimately to build the kind of momentum we needed um, to try to get peacekeepers deployed there to stop the violence. Um, and from the very beginning, we knew um, that the only way we could get people to care is with images, um, with taking Marcus um, along. In a real collaboration, it's not like, you know, I was doing the research and Marcus was taking the pictures. Uh, we wanted to tell the story um, in a visual way um, to make people relate to what was happening in the Central African Republic, to understand that this was happening to real people um, that we can care about, um, to ultimately bring about change in the country. I'm just gonna kick it over to Marcus before I pose a question to Carol. Marcus, I think in other conversations we've had, the question always comes up, do you work a certain way when you're with Human Rights Watch versus when you're on a different sort of job or mission? And I, I know the answer to that, but maybe you could talk a little bit about how you work when you're on mission with Peter versus other settings and how you worked in this particular setting a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, the quick response is no, I, do, I, I don't work in any, in a different way at all. Uh, essentially, I'm going to report on what I see and if I'm going for National Geographic magazine or if I'm going for Human Rights Watch, there is no difference in the way I work. The only difference is that I'm sat in a car with Peter Bukart, who is a human rights lawyer, uh, who has to justify the work that he does 
um, with a level of accuracy that can stand up in, a, in an environment such as the International Criminal Court, as opposed to sitting there with a journalist who has to fact check in a very similar way. And so the, the, the ideas are, co w the collaboration is very, very similar to that, that that I would have with a journalist. The ideas are very similar. We travel together and, and the, the images that I create are e exactly the same. I wouldn't go in, a, I wouldn't work in, a, in any different way and I wouldn't point my camera in a different direction at all. There's the choices are exactly the same. And I just want to ask Peter to maybe elucidate on one point before I ask Carol a very important question. And that is, just, I think this is something that I know, but I think it might be of interest. The physical conditions when you guys were working in CAR, I'm going to say CAR for everyone that's Central African Republic. There are certain points that I think you had mentioned, you know, you had to take your own food. I mean, the conditions really are, I don't want to say extreme, but there were a lot of things that have to go on on the ground so that you can actually do the work. Do you want to just say a little bit about that in terms of like how you get established so you can actually physically get around and connect with the people to do the testimony taking and so on? Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's important that we're not the story, that we're going there to document the story of what's happening to a people. Uh, but, you know, we're, we live in like a, a social media world where we think that everything is documented and filmed and just available to us. And the reality in the Central African Republic was if we hadn't taken these very extreme measures to actually get the story, to document these massacres, to rebuild the bridges and go the extra mile, um, a lot of this information never would have come out. Um, and the fact that the conflict was flipping um, from the Seleka burning all the villages to these anti balaka militias, the people with all of these little amulets on them, which they believe uh, protect them from bullets and um, harm, um, who then engaged in their own wave of violence against the Muslim community, the fact that these dynamics were changing would have not have been known if we didn't go this extra mile. Um, but you know, we had to set out to get this story. Um, and we had to plan very carefully. Um, we needed to take camping gear. We even traveled with a chainsaw, not to defend ourselves, but to cut down the trees that people cut across the road to um, block the roads. Um, and, you know, you don't want to be like, you know, two days out in the bush and realize you forgot the matches to start the fire. Um, it was really physically tough. I mean, we, we, you know, showered in buckets for week and weeks on end um, and slept very roughly. Um, but otherwise, the story wouldn't have been told. That's the reality. So the story, and this is where I want to go to Carol, because I think one of the reasons we combine this clip the way we did is obviously you're at the film festival and we deal a lot with storytelling and narratives and, and characters versus I think what we might normally term reporting or documentation. And I guess, Carol, you know, I, I would like to hear a little bit because I know you were involved with the creation of the feature, but obviously you were intimately involved with getting the information out as it came. And I guess uh, there's this tension or maybe just a contrast between the idea of storytelling and reporting, but you can combine them. And I'm just curious if you could talk a little bit about in the early days when the crisis was first breaking, because we're going to get into later on how you handled managing the information sort of from what we'll call headquarters, the distribution dissemination side. I, I think what Peter just said is very important about how the facts come into being, that we live in this information age where we think everything is just like a Google search, and the idea that the facts do not get themselves. So I sometimes, I'm gonna inflict on you a kooky metaphor, but this really is how I think of it, that when, when Peter or another Human Rights Watch researcher finds evidence of a massacre in some obscure place like the Central African Republic, it's, it's like a heavy boulder. It's, an in, it's inert. It doesn't have energy and power of its own. And here I'm drawing on long forgotten high school physics, but you know that idea of kinetic energy, that when you pick up a heavy object and you put it in motion, it then has energy. And what we try to do at Human Rights Watch is to take the heavy objects that we find in the field, the tragic facts of human rights abuse in faraway places that people don't care about, and by communicating them, we put them into motion. So the, 
the point of taking what we try to do at headquarters and what Peter does himself very ably and Marcus does himself on social media from the ground, and that's an interesting new fact that we have now, a new tool in our toolkit at Human Rights Watch is the immediacy of social media. But we're constantly trying to put that information in motion, to write the press release about it, to write the dispatch about it, to get the op-ed, to get the journalists, if there are any, to write articles about it, to get Christian Amanpour to pick up the footage, to you know, to testify in Congress about it, as one of our colleagues did, to just to make the information move. Because when information moves, then it has power. And getting the facts about the Central African Republic out there and in motion was critically important. Now, that doesn't exactly address your question about reportage versus storytelling. I guess I feel that most uh, great reportage is based on stories. and. One of the interesting things that we began to understand when we first started doing multimedia work at Human Rights Watch more than 10 years ago with Marcus and other great photographers mm -hmm. is that our researchers are trained to gather a huge range of evidence that will prove a case. So they need 50 cases of someone who's been tortured so that they can prove that this government is doing that. At the end of the process, when you're trying to make a multimedia feature, you need one case, you need one story. You need to know what color dress was she wearing when they came and took away her husband. You need to be able to tell a whole little narrative. And it's a different form of information collection. And sometimes now we have to ask our researchers, you know, in addition to getting the wide, broad, sort of horizontal sweep of evidence, give us the vertical, deep story about what happened to one person because that's really how we all absorb information, right? We tell each other stories. Excellent. I think I'm going to stop there because that's a great segue to the second clip. And the clip you're about to see now, we're just going to stand off to the side for a minute, is sort of a media montage to give you a bit of a sense of some of the coverage we got. And then we'll come back and talk about that for a minute. So clip two. So I think that set of clips gives people some sense of <coughs> how the material and the information was disseminated. But I guess the, th the two words that are coming into my mind, again, are tools, I think you mentioned tools, and targets. And I think um, one of the things that is interesting about the digital storytelling language is that we're talking about a whole level, um, from social media to broadcast television, newspapers, websites. So I guess, Peter and Marcus, I'll start with you again, because I feel like there's sort of a chronology to how you started to get material out and in which way you used it and who your potential targets were and how that evolved over time and then maybe how the targets shifted. I don't know if you could talk about that just a little bit because I think there's a narrative there that's very compelling. Yeah, look, I'm a human rights activist and I don't see my job just as documenting violence and killings and human rights abuses, but also as to try to save people's lives and to try to stop the violence. So um, that gave a real immediacy to our work. Um, we didn't have you know, the luxury of sitting around for six months documenting these things and then writing a big report at the end um, while all these people were being slaughtered all around us. Um, we set out uh, believing that the International Criminal Court needed to launch a new investigation um, and that we needed UN peacekeepers on the ground to try to stop the violence. And when we started talking about that, people thought we were absolutely crazy. I mean, why would the UN send peacekeepers to a country most of the world didn't even know existed? So we launched this social media campaign. We live blogged the conflict over a number of platforms, basically reporting every day what was happening uh, through images and with tweets and on Instagram. And then we also took our video from these trips and brought it to CNN, to Amanpour, um, to ABC, and to other networks. And I wrote a series of articles uh, for Foreign Policy and the Daily Telegraph, um, New York Times, Washington Post. None of this could have been possible <coughs> without Marcus. I mean, um, you know, we were able to convince CNN to run a story on the Central African Republic and ABC because we had this powerful footage of what was happening on the ground. Um, and that's the way our world works. Um, they want visual images from these places. Um, and that's how we can bring about change. 
So after two years, there are now nearly 10,000 UN peacekeepers deployed in the Central African Republic. And there is an international criminal court investigation going on um, to hold those responsible for the violence accountable. Um, so it did not just result in increased attention to the Central African Republic, but real change. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, uh, and I want to bring Marcus in, and this maybe actually becomes a question for Carol a little bit too, because I think one of the things that has echoed when we talk about this story is that at one point, you guys kind of were reporting the story. I think there was a comment made that journalists couldn't get there or journalists weren't there. And so I, I, in some ways that puts us in like an unusual position at Human Rights Watch. Like we are now the source of the information in addition to reporting and documenting and advocating for change. So Marcus, I'd love to hear you talk about that a little bit. And then Carol, I feel like you probably could comment on that as well because it affects how we package the information and push it, I think, so. Yeah, I, I think that because of Peter's great research, there were many occasions actually that we were the only people on the ground in in whatever situation, and, and there the, the situations are too numerous to mention, but there were many situations that Peter was the only person there and I was the only camera there. That doesn't say too much about the industry because actually in the whole country at any time, there were probably less than seven or eight international journalists covering the whole conflict at any one time. It, it was a Dis disastrously undercovered conflict. And so when there is a situation like that where there is a lot of international competition for news play, we, you know, news doesn't happen in a vacuum. You know, Nelson Mandela had just passed away. Um, the Ukraine was blowing up. There were other huge stories going on in the world and we had to make sure that the Central African Republic didn't s drop off the news agenda. And so using social media to engage policymakers was one key thing, but also using the footage and the stills to engage the international press and bring them on board to run articles to keep the, the, the issue in the mainstream media was another. And, 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 and I think that was really key. There, are two, there were two layers that we were creating there. We were creating, as Peter mentioned, a direct policy dialogue with policymakers, notably initially the French government and the French Ministry of Defense and secondly, the UN. And then later on, as you mentioned, you know, our, our ideas changed, the conflict changed, the focus of our reporting and our decision-making changed, and so the people that we were aiming our work at changed. And, and this is kind of key. Maybe this is one, when you, the first question you asked me, do, do you work in any different ways as a photographer for Human Rights Watch and National Geographic magazine? Maybe this is one of them, actually. The very kind of key thing is that at some point we have, we direct at policymakers the work that we've already created. So the creation doesn't change, but what we do with it changes. And so we focus it directly at policymakers and we focus it at the media. And we try to disseminate it as widely as we possibly can. And that's what happened in this, oca in this occasion. Yeah, if I may. So there's a tension in Human Rights Watch's work about uh, the global spotlight. So one of the many ways in which we fundamentally differ from journalists. So when I was the foreign editor at Newsweek, we had the editorial meeting on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. and everyone went around the table, each editor of each section, and pitched like what stories we had for the week. Here was the you know five foreign stories that I was pitching. And the highest praise you could get from the editor in chief, this is what you really waited for, is if he said, nothing but readers. That was good, right? That meant like your story was gonna have lots of readers and that's what a magazine wants, right? I mean, you want for the money and also just the attention and that's what you're looking for. So at Human Rights Watch, we're covering the places that have no readers. It's just not our yardstick. We're not looking at the world as, you know, where is the attention going and what do we have to cover because that's where the readers are. We're covering the places that have no readers and we're trying to get readers. Now having said that, we're also obviously aware of what people are willing to pay attention to at a certain time. I can tell you, we have long, long and fruitlessly labored on the country of Burundi, and only in recent weeks has anyone started to care. <laughs> so our researchers also be very attuned to where the global media spotlight is like randomly swinging its light, and if it happens to light on your country, be ready, because that's when you've gotta have something to say, 
ready, ready packaged, you know, whatever your message is, don't hesitate because that global media spotlight is going to go somewhere else fast. And here we were trying to direct a global media spotlight to, as Peter said, it's probably the most obscure country, in the, like it's in Africa and it's somewhere in the center, you know, nobody knew where it was or what was happening in it. So we both have to try to create a spotlight and then we also have to make use of the spotlight when, when it lands where we need it to. I'm going to stop there. We're going to switch gears a little bit with this next clip. Um, as some of you who've been to other films in the festival know, there's a little bit of a sub-theme in the festival this year of humor. So I'm going to set this clip up with that comment. A little bit of humor, and then we're going to talk about that when we come back. Dark humor, but very clear. Good, good shot. Right. The, the next spot was like this huge chomp on this Right. Side. So, right. So, I mean, needless to say, the joke in the <laughs> editorial suite was, wouldn't it be ironic if after everything, Peter got eaten by a crocodile? Like, after all... The, but, but let me just take a moment to say that um, part of the reason that we decided to include this clip, for those who work in documentary or other film, there's outtakes, and there's lots of outtakes when you're on mission. And we happen to have this one on camera. Part of the reason we chose it, and you know, Peter and Marcus can elaborate on this, and I think Carol can share other stories too, is we wanted to show that yes, there is humor, and that's perhaps part of how you manage the situation. But I think not only does it show the humor with you two, but also just the bonding. I mean, you're obviously working with people on the ground in the country who are being affected directly by what's going on. And how do you build rapport and just sort of like relate on a very basic human level? Like nobody wants to get eaten by the crocodiles, no matter who you are. So I just, I was hoping maybe, and then Peter Marcus, I know you've talked about this before, but there are certain moments and maybe you can just share another story or just talk about how you sort of utilize that humor and joking around with people you're working with. Mm -hmm. How you slept together, Carol sang. Oh. It's, uh, it's very difficult to share a tent with Marcus because he snores. Just kidding. I snore, actually. He always wants to talk first at this point. <laughs> he has to get his word in edge with. We, we were working in an environment of extreme violence, and um, it's really important to win people's trust, including the killers. I mean, we had many meetings um, with both the Seleka and the Antibalaka militia where we confronted them with their crimes. Um, but I think we still won their trust um, by building a human relationship with them. And that's a really important part of my work. But actually, I wanted to talk about something slightly different about the clip, because actually what we were doing is going from one of the burned villages on the main road um, to search where the people who had been displaced uh, were living. Um, and we had to walk about four or five miles out into the bush um, across the river, uh, but we found people living in incredibly desperate conditions. The first man we met was the village chief, and he had just buried his two grandchildren. Um, I think they were six and nine months the week before, dead from malaria. And, you know, almost all the limited media who'd been there had images of burned villages. Uh, but we reasoned the people had to have gone somewhere. Um, and we stopped and we waited for people to come out and guide us to where they had gone. gone. And actually the most dramatic story we developed from their mission was the tremendous humanitarian suffering that was taking place, again, away from people's, um, you know, where, where the spotlight was. Um, but we had to make the extra step. And when you're doing this kind of work, you often have to think, like, how am I going to get the information I want, and it's not just about empty villages, it's about people's experience, and we had to go find them. <coughs> yeah, I mean, there are, there were many occasions like that. That was a, uh, whilst you saw on the clip, it w there were there are light-hearted moments, and, and y you need them to survive. You might be wearing the field for weeks and weeks and weeks, and I'm sure there are many journalists in here that can maybe um, empathize with that feeling that, that, that humor allows you to continue. It allows you to go to the next day and the next day and the next day. But that particular situation, whilst we had humor and it was probably one of the saddest days we've had and one of the most emotional moments that we both had in that on that first trip. And and to see these 
people it, living in such a desperate situation, hoping that we <laughs> were actually the first wave of a long wave of help, which in fact we, we weren't. <laughs> you know, it, it came much, much, much later. The best thing we could do was leave a few pieces of our medical kit to try to allow them to survive a little longer. The, n the doctor that we met in that field there had nothing in his med kit, nothing, not a pill, not a nothing. He, he showed us this box. It was <laughs> empty, just empty. And the, m the most we could do was just like throw everything that we had in our med kits into his box and leave. And, and, that, and that felt pathetic and pointless. Um, but, uh, but also sad in a way that it was Human Rights Watch that had to do that. Where were all the other agencies that had traveled down that road many times before, and, and, and in fact, they hadn't stopped the car and walked in to find these people to see if there was possibly something they could do? And, and that was really unfortunate. So we reported that. We used social media. We, you know, we got back to a city where we could file, and we reused social media, and we told that story immediately that night and called on the other agencies that were present in the country to say, listen, yes, go down the roads, but also stop and walk into the bush. There are thousands of people out there. And uh, Medicines on Frontier um, started a number of mobile clinics, including in that town, um, to actually provide medical assistance for the people, um, which improved the situation quite significantly. And, and I think, I mean, just hearing you, like you take that moment, I mean, I can visualize an empty medical kit right now. and. When you take that moment to step back and go, okay, this is just so sad, or just acknowledge that, and I think that's something we just wanted to include this because that is part of the work, is like stepping back for a second and to maintain one's sanity, I think just going, okay, this is crazy, or this is awful, or just acknowledging it for a minute. And I just, you know, maybe I'll bring Carol in a little bit because I don't want to go too much into detail, but I think when people go on mission and are doing the reporting and the documentation and getting the stories out, working in pairs or having, you know, being with another team member, and I think Peter and Marcus could talk this, but, but I think more generally maybe you can talk a little bit about in the research, I think there's something there, because if you were just on your own experiencing these things, I think we've learned through various experiences that's not ideal for journalists, for researchers, for whomever, like. I don't know if you want to speak to that. Well, we, we always send uh, kind of new researchers, even though they've been extensively trained by us in the office, essentially, or they may have gone on danger training with the BBC or what have you. Uh, we always send them out with a buddy in their first missions so that they get further acquainted with how to do the field work. Um, and in dangerous situations, we wouldn't allow a researcher to work alone. Uh, they would work in pairs or with a with a very experienced photographer, and it's something Peter has a lot of experience of. But I, I think the issue of um, the psychological health of people who do this kind of work is a is a very important one. And as managers, we've learned to pay more attention to it over the years. And we do have somebody who's on call 24/7 for researchers, or not just researchers who might need someone to talk to about what they've seen and what they've experienced. You know, I have to say. Our brilliant multimedia team at Human Rights Watch who edit video like this um, can also be very strongly affected by the imagery that they work with, even more so than the people who are editing words on my team. Who And I've done that, and I've sat in front of my terminal and burst into tears. Uh, but there is something so much stronger about pictures, and uh, the multimedia editors who work on this are can also be very traumatized by it, as can our researchers. So we we pay a close attention to that issue. Yeah, I mean, we work in war zones, and there's a lot of false machismo um, by a lot of people who do this kind of work, which I think is very destructive. And I think actually to survive, it's really important to care about the people whose lives you're documenting um, and to help, try to help them a lot of times. I mean, um, Marcus and I paused a lot and bought a hell of a lot of sugar and food and medical um, supplies and all kind of stuff. I mean, our, we, we ran like a local delivery service almost on a lot of days, which helped us feel in the, this very immediate sense that we were also bringing something to the people whose suffering we were documenting. And I think a lot of people who work in these conflict zones 
they don't show enough care and it actually impact I at the end they end up paying the price yeah i'd just like to say something about that too because i think uh, i mean there were times when and you're, you're a human before you're a photographer and you're a human before you're a human rights watch researcher or a, or a lawyer and and y there is a human reaction when you're in these environments in that you you have to in some way whatever you can possibly do to alleviate whatever suffering is going on you just do it and then you do your job and and sometimes they kind of mix in the middle somewhere and so many of the situations that we found ourselves in or many of the report much of the reporting that we did happened because we'd been ferrying food in or bringing in a, you know a some units so that somebody could call their wife in a different town because they'd been separated because one was Muslim and one was Christian and they hadn't spoken for nine months and we tried to put those people together. And so when we were, you know, when those moments were happening, the, the reporting happened. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and we were actually nurtured by the communities and, and taken in by the communities and, and shown things that maybe other people didn't get because that was going on. But I think it's really important as well. I just kind of want to mention this because, m you know, Peter mentioned there's this kind of a machismo thing within the journalism industry, and, and we don't address issues of PTSD as uh, as maybe acutely and as directly as we should do. Um, it's that kind of unspoken thing that no one touches on. It's that that thing that oh no, it's you know, let's not worry about it. In the 70s, it was like let's drink a bottle of whiskey and get over it, and and we cannot work in that way. In Central African Republic, you know, I'm very clear. I used the services of Human Rights Watch psychiatrist. I needed to, and uh, after many weeks in the field, I could not. Something broke in my head. In Salgado, once called it. I don't know if any of you have seen the film Salt of the Earth. Um, he s he calls it when he was in Rwanda. My um, my soul broke, I think, and and something like that happens. And, and that's what definitely happened to me at some point in Central African Republic, and I thankfully had the services of Human Rights Watch and the great team that they have medically to deal, deal with this. But our industry doesn't talk about this as much as it should do, and journalists don't talk about this as much as it should do, and we push it away and we deal with it and we kind of big it up. And, and, and I think it's about time that maybe people should put it out the front and say, we need to use these services and we need to be able to, not just the people that go there, but the teams that we rely on in the field, the fixers, the, the, the local human rights researchers, they also need access to this sort of services. It's important. Thank you. Yeah, I just think, Carol. Well, I just want to say quickly that I, I used to wonder why such unbelievably fantastic photographers were willing to work for Human Rights Watch. Um, people like Marcus Bluesdale, just one of the best photographers alive today. Why, why is it that they would work for this you know, kind of grimy little NGO? And um, especially when we were even smaller than we are today. And we did pay, but not as well as you could earn with journalism. And why would, why? And I, I did come to appreciate that some of the photographers, great photographers who work with us, it's really hard to be a journalist. Just to you know, hop from war to war documenting and never feeling like you're engaging. And I, a guy once applied for a job at Human Rights Watch. He was a journalist, and I said, why do you want to come work at an NGO? He said, I want to get out of the bleachers and join the game. And I thought that was a nice way of putting it. And there's something, I, it may even have been Peter who once said to me, you know, I got to take a rest from doing research because I got to go do advocacy. If I'm not out there talking to foreign ministries about what I'm doing and feeling like I'm actually part of creating a solution, it's too much. It wasn't Peter, but it was somebody who maybe kind of <laughs> like him. Um, and I just, I mean, thank you all for going into that. And it's something that may come up in the Q&A. And anybody who's interested, we can talk to you afterwards about resources and other things, because this came up in the prior presentation. But I just want to thank you all for sharing that, because as those of us who've worked in this field a long time know, if you're not taking care of yourself and helping yourself, you're not going to help anyone. And I'm not going to preach. I'm from the South. I'm not going to go down that path. But... I just want to thank you all for sharing because actually it sets up this fourth clip and this fourth clip will then lead into the Q&A with you all. So thank you for being patient. But this fourth clip that we're going to show, um, I just want to advise people, it's quite graphic and we have chosen to show it for a specific set of reasons which we'll get into, but I just want to advise people, it's rather graphic, so be prepared. 
Um, and it kind of speaks to some of the issues we were just talking about, because when you see this clip, I think it gives you a sense of some of the things that people are exposed to when they're in the field working. So fourth clip, and then we're going to come back. So um, with this clip, um, and it was the subject of some debate, um, I just want to explain to people that this was a clip that we obviously chose not to use in the online feature. And I think the d discussion around this clip kind of falls into two spaces. One, when you use a clip that's this graphic, um, is it actually counterproductive to your advocacy goals, your activism goals, et cetera? That's one question that we can sort of debate because I think there are other people who would argue if you don't really show what's going on in its full extremity, people aren't gonna get it. I think there's some debate, maybe not on this stage, but I just wanna acknowledge that these kind of graphic clips do pose certain challenges. The other side of it that I just wanna touch on that you might wanna comment on is even just in the context of storytelling and filmmaking, for those of you who work in that industry, with a clip like this, it's confusing. You don't know who people are. It's quite extreme. Uh, you see acronyms. You don't know, you know, even if you were putting this clip in a certain story with that level of violence, does it work filmically or storytelling-wise? So I'm going to let Marcus and Peter comment on this. And Marcus, I know you weren't there, but I just, I think there's a debate around this clip, and we chose to show it because it's problematic in many ways, and Carol can chime in. but. Can you just comment on this? Because I think it's important. Yeah, I mean, look, this is what Marcus and I saw almost every day. Um, sometimes we'd see six of these before breakfast um, for months in the Central African Republic. This is really what was happening in the Central African Republic um, from about December 2013 till March, April 2014. Um, and it's important that it is filmed. I mean, we're also there to collect evidence. Um, and we don't know what we'll be able to use and not use. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's also important that we portray people with dignity, even the victims of violence, um, and that we don't engage in war pornography. Um, I mean, I think we as a world, as a country, are exposed to so much more violence and images of violence now than we were when I was young uh, and most of you were young. Um, you know, you can go on YouTube and see beheadings just by typing in beheadings. Uh, I don't think we could do that um, a few decades ago. Um, so I think that also places on us a responsibility um, to think about how we portray violence. Um, while at the same time trying to be as honest as possible in telling the story of what was happening in the Central African Republic um, and the kind of mutilations that were taking place and the extreme violence um, that people were exposed to. Um, it, I think if, if you're going to use this kind of um, footage, you have to do it in a way which really explains and contextualizes it and it's not just used to shock people. Um, and there were times where we um, used very graphic images. Um, you saw some of them in the stories we wrote. Um, because at the same time, you know, while these killings were taking place, the French ambassador tried to convince me that I didn't know the, um, the meaning of the word massacre and that for the French that reminded them of the Holocaust and shouldn't be just kind of thrown around in places like the Central African Republic. So we were also in an information war um, against people who were trying to seriously downplay what was happening in the Central African Republic. Yeah, I think as a photographer and filmmaker, you have a, a couple of challenges here. You need, first and foremost, you need to tell the truth. Um, and coupled with that, you also have to engage. You have to make people listen and look. And to use too many of the images that you see behind at the time, I think, certainly with stills photography, pushes people away. Um, I still get that feeling when I see clips like this. 
that I don't really engage so much. And so I think as a photographer and filmmaker, I think it's important to, as Peter mentioned, to maintain the dignity of a nation in the work that you create and use that dignity to draw you guys in, to use in some ways the beauty that we can create with photography, to draw a reader or someone who could, is a potential um, policy changer into the story so they can learn more. And so we need, yes, we do need to tell the truth, and yes, we do need to show images like this because that was reality, that's what was happening. But you, there are, there you can absolutely overdo it. And my job, in a way, as a photographer and filmmaker, is to entice you, to bring you into the story, to engage you in a way, and then give you the truth. And that's the balance uh, as a photographer. But overall, and especially in places like this, and I, we had so many discussions about this when we were in the field with Peter, my main job is, throughout all of this, is to try to maintain the dignity of the people that we document and also maintain the dignity of the nation that we're reporting on. And there are so many occasions in which we saw maybe people not doing uh, their job in a way that would maintain the dignity of the nation and the people they documented, which is really unfortunate, I think. And as journalists and as, and as human rights activists, I think we have to think about that when we go into these places. Uh, and there also were many occasions where we were face to face with extreme violence and people being mutilated and all of these things, uh, where it was very clear that they were actually acting up and playing to the camera, um, and where we actually put down our cameras and walked away and showed our extreme disapproval, where others were like, great, keep doing it, this is great footage, you know? Um, I, th I think you do have a responsibility at that stage, especially as a human rights activist, to, to show your disapproval and not to encourage this kind of um, extreme violence. I, I think the key word that Marcus just used is dignity. And another difference I would note between human rights activists and journalists, a super important one, is that our primary responsible is not to you, the reader, or you, the watcher. Our primary responsibility is to, is to the victim, to the eyewitness, to the people we've met in the field. And to their dignity, number one, and also to their safety. And we have had episodes of collaborations with journalists who wanted to show somebody on camera because they were telling a really awesome story and this was really gonna draw a lot of, you know, this, this is nothing but readers, right? And that's what the journalist wants. And we've had fights with editors and camera people saying, well, you're not going to use that. If you're going to use it, we're taking Human Rights Watch's name off it. We won't touch that. So it's really about the safety and the dignity of the people who are represented. That's the cardinal rule. So actually, at this point, I do have, I see one mic. We have mics for the audience. Um, I think yeah, those of you who've been here before, we have one mic on each side, and I'm gonna, sorry, I just need to move away from the light. I see your hand right up front. Francis, do you mind? We'll start in the front, and I see the hand right here, and we'll move back. Sorry, I just have to get out of the light to see the hands for you guys. There we go. Hi, guys. Hi, Andrea, good to see you again. Hi. Um, first of all, I've been a huge fan of this film festival and your work for about 15 years now. And what's always amazed me is how you choose to frame a story. Because like you were talking about, you want to make sure that the dignity of the person and whatever is going on is intact. However, say for example, if the story on the ground is really, really hot and no one's paying attention, how do you frame and tell that story so that the uh, global news, whatever, is gonna, is gonna hit it and is there a fine line, or, or, or what parameters do you use so that you don't cross that line and, and hurt somebody or, or put someone in danger? Because that's always, what, what am I saying? A paradox in how you create that yeah. ambiance. Is that clear? Yeah, I, uh, I do get that. If I could just say, so when we think about framing the story, and I'll let Marcus and Peter talk about how they frame it, but from, from headquarters when we're editing a video or editing a press release or a dispatch or anything. It's really about using the tricks of the journalism trade. And you know, our multimedia team is often making three to five minute spots that look like TV spots. And we use all the, so I'll just tell you a quick story. One time we were having our annual fundraising dinner for Human Rights Watch. And it was during the time of Darfur. 
so like more than 10 years ago. And we had this little clip in our little dinner film that was ABC News had gone with our researcher into Darfur. And in the middle of our video about how great Human Rights Watch is and how you should all give us money, which is our most engaging, wonderful video that we make all year because we really want you to give us money, there was a little piece from ABC News and you heard the World News Tonight music like day, 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 and then you heard, you know, Peter Jennings tonight, if you remember who he was, <laughs> takes you tonight inside Darfur. And you could feel in this huge room, ballroom full of people that people started to sit up a little straighter and they were listening in a different way. It was like Pavlovian because that music had triggered for them journalism, listen, they just, they absorb information. When you put information into a format that is recognizable as journalism, even if it's human rights information, people absorb it better. So our multimedia is supposed to look like a TV spot because that's what you're used to watching. And our press releases read by like an AP story because that's what you're used to reading. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you for your work. I have really quick questions and maybe put them all together. What is the present situation today? And what is the role of the central government in the situation today, and really briefly, could you talk about the demographics and geography of the country? So, where's the main city? What's the role of the government, and what's the situation today? Thank you. Sure. Um, the Central African Republic, whose capital is called Bangui, um, is about 15% Muslim and 85% non-Muslim. Um, and I use the term non-Muslim because it's kind of hard to determine whether people are Christian or more animist, traditionalist in their beliefs. Um, it has a lot of gold and diamonds, and basically these conflicts, even though they ended up in a fight between um, in the anti-Muslim kind of um, ethnic cleansing, are much more about different armed groups trying to seize control of the central government so they can control the diamond mines and the gold mines um, and use the country as their private bank. Um, the, the violence has gone down a lot in the west of the country, partly because all of the Muslims have fled the country um, from the west. Um, there's hundreds of thousands of people in displacement camps in Cameroon, uh, which Marcus and I visited um, November last year, and in Chad as well, uh, with no real prospect of going home anytime soon. Um, I would say that there still is a real not really a very effective government in the country. Um, the problem of corruption is still very present. Um, and unless that is addressed, um, you know, the, the problem is that we're gonna have to go back to the Central African Republic in five years when the next major battle breaks out for who controls those resources. Um, so our hope is that with this kind of tremendous crisis that there will now be enough international attention to kind of address some of those root causes um, of the violence in the Central African Republic. Um, and we have a permanent researcher, Louis Mudge, who worked with us uh, during those two years, who basically spends half of his time now in the Central African Republic engaging with the local government and the various international actors on the ground um, to keep that focus on reform. Yeah, there's a lot of hands. We have the mic over here, and then we have one on the other side, and then I'll try to go up in the back, because we haven't gone back there. Right. Good evening. Um, I have a comment slash question. Um, I remember a few, few years ago, um, I was talking to an executive producer who was doing video reportage in region like Congo, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and I asked him, would you take female reporter with you on the field in these areas? And he told me, we would get the negative attention, the unwanted attention to have a, a woman with us in our team. And I see that you are Peter and Marcus, two men in this country. If tomorrow you have to do this again and need a third person, would you take a woman with you? Absolutely, um, and half of my emergency team um, are women. It's actually unusual um, that this yeah. is like this actually in some ways. Look, uh, the. The, whoever the producer was you talked to um, doesn't really know what goes on in the field. I'm not going to call him an idiot, but um, the, 
women are some of our, I think there's definitely more women researchers at Human Rights Watch than men. Um, and they are some of our most effective researchers. Um, and they also are a lot more effective on a lot of the sensitive issues that we face in conflict. Um, and actually, obviously, you know, there are issues in terms of exposure to sexual violence and those kind of things that we have to be aware of. Uh, but I can tell you in many situations, it's a lot more difficult for a man to get through a checkpoint in a war zone than for a woman. Um, and my colleague Anya Neistat, who was on our emergency team for many years, um, was a specialist in sneaking into some of the most difficult to reach zones. Uh, because women are often invisible in these kind of situations when they're sitting on a bus um, going into Chechnya or a place like that. Um, so your, your friend was definitely way off the mark. Yeah, I've worked in many of the countries that you just mentioned. And, and actually, uh, I, I worked with Anna van Rutenberg for almost 10 years in, in Congo, uh, who has done most of the reporting over a decade in, in DRC. And, and Peter is the first male I've worked with in nearly 15 years in... I was actually very disappointed. <laughs> but uh, I was going with Peter, but... Um, also, you have to say that Annika is like six feet tall and blonde, too. Yeah, 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 and she kicks ass. She's much more fierce than Peter ever it would be. But yeah, I mean, I've been in Darfur, in Georgia, in Central African Republic, in Congo, in, in many of these countries, and, and every time I've, I've been there with uh, Human Rights Watch Risa, who's been female. Two-thirds of the people who work for Human Rights Watch are women. Okay, um, could you give a little bit more of the history of uh, the background in Central African Republic? I know it was a French colony, but some of the recent history of how it got free and how it ended up in such a situation. And who were the dudes, the heavily armed paratroopers who had light-colored skin, who had the big guns and were firing them in that last clip? Yeah, um, I can't go too deep into the history of the Central African Republic because we'll be here till midnight then. Um, obviously, it's the country where um, Bokassa um, crowned himself emperor um, and was overthrown. But really, just to give you a snapshot, um, the crisis in the Central African Republic really dates back about 10 years when the now deposed President Bozize uh, took power in a military coup, and he brought a lot of mercenaries with him uh, when he overthrew the government and promised to incorporate them into the army. Um, he never did, so all of these men um, who'd been fighting for him went back to the bush and started new rebellions, um, which ultimately led to the rebellion in 2014. But, you know, the Central African Republic is one of the poorest countries in Africa. You saw um, the conditions of the roads, um, and that was actually a major highway in the Central African Republic we were driving down. Um, you should always um, take um, African road maps with a grain of salt. Um, but it also is very rich in diamonds and gold. Um, and it sh the people should not be living in this absolute poverty if the resources of the country were actually used for the development of the country. Um, the heavily armed men you saw in the last clip um, are French soldiers who were um, deployed to the Central African Republic in December 2013 uh, to try to stabilize the situation. And those were actually foreign legion soldiers. Um, so they're like foreigners who did something bad and then joined the foreign legion of the French army and had their identity swiped. A lot of them were Serbs and other um, people um, who've sometimes been involved in crimes back home. Um, and you saw how afraid they were um, in the situation. Uh, they were firing in, in the air to try to disperse the, the anti-Balaka militia who had just killed somebody and the anti balaka wasn't moving at all. Um, so it really was. The, this mission actually um, has caused more soldiers to come home with PTSD um, than any other recent French mission, um, including Afghanistan. We have the mic over here. I promised I'd go in the back section. I see all the hands. We're going to go back here, and I think there were a couple more hands in My there. question kind of touches on something that's been discussed in the journalism field for the last couple years. and. Your experience kind of in your own, balancing your own personal safety in these, this kind of work 
um, and human rights work and journalism work to getting the story and getting the footage and how, how can you speak a bit more to how you're making those decisions and how it may differ in Africa from places such as the Middle East? Yeah, I mean, look, Jim Foley, who was killed by the um, Islamic State, um, was a very close friend of mine. Um, so I'm, I'm very conscious of security and the risks we take. Um, we've lost a lot of friends um, in the last few years, including Tim Hetherington, um, who was as close a collaborator with Human Rights Watch as Marcus Bleasdale um, was. I, I kept telling Marcus that he was the stand-in for Tim in the Central African Republic. Um, so we take our security extremely serious, and um, a tremendous amount of planning and discussions um, went into making these missions as secure as possible. And one thing that really disturbs me in kind of young journalism is that people try to make their names by going to these extremely dangerous war zones like Syria right now and Iraq. And they kind of follow this big pack. And if you think, as a young journalist or a photographer or a videographer, um, that you're going to be able to compete with the big names um, in these places, you're wrong. Um, if you really want to make a career for yourself, do like Marcus and I did, and take the path less traveled. Go to the places that are not getting any coverage. Um, rather than following the big rat pack, and prepare yourself. I mean, take the hostile environment training, um, think through the security issues. If you need body armor, bring it, and get yourself insured, um, because otherwise, you're not just putting yourself in danger, uh, but you're gonna create a lot of problems for people around you um, who are going to have to sort out the trouble that you create. And also, as a, as a young journalist, you know, Peter mentioned hostile environment training. That includes med, med training. You should be medically trained when you're going into this environment. And we have this policy that we, n we never let anyone in our car unless they are medically trained. So if something happens to our car and both Peter and I are in need of medical attention, that third person should be in a situation to save our lives. And, and if you can't do that, you're not coming in our car. And, and, and if you can't do that, you shouldn't be going to these environments. So I would, if there are young journalists in this room that are thinking of going to places like this, I wouldn't even think about buying a camera until you've done a first aid course. I wouldn't even think about buying a video, video camera without doing a hostile environments course. Do not go to these places unless you've been trained. And in the aftermath of Tim's death in Libya, um, Sebastian Younger started a program called RISC, um, which actually provides free medical training um, for freelancers doing this kind of work. So um, you may not even have to foot the bill. And it's a great effort. It's expensive. I feel like I ought to say that somewhere. This is expensive. This is, this is the result of something that a big institution, I mean, Human Rights Watch, we're an NGO, but we're a relatively big institution. We're not like freelancers just throwing people out there. We're super careful and cautious. We, we have a full-time security guy on our staff now. We hired him from the BBC. Um, when Marcus won the Robert Kappa Award at the Overseas Press Club dinner, there was a lot of like buzz in the room because he'd been assigned not by a media organization but by Human Rights Watch. And nobody ever won the Robert Kappa Award who'd been assigned by an NGO and not a media institution. And the fact it was happening at the Overseas Press Club that people were going <laughs> And one dude from the Wall Street Journal asked me afterwards, he said, how much did it cost? to keep Marcus Bleasdale to, I, I don't want to like reveal Marcus's fees or anything. <laughs> not a lot, that part of it. Yeah, not a lot, that part of it. But you know, the cost of these missions, I mean, it's, you know, this is, we're talking about tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this. And there isn't another media institution that's willing to invest that kind of money in the Central African Republic. That's one reason that you don't see the footage, because it costs. So yeah, we have Mike in the middle, and then we'll come back across the middle over here. Francis, do you see this hand right here? Oh, sorry, yeah. up in the front, sorry. I'm sorry, I'm interrupting your question. Please That's go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. My question was more in terms of uh, some of the communities that you're working with and the local peace builders and the local activists that you work with, and how do you incorporate their stories uh, into your human rights reporting? Yeah, 
uh, thanks. That's a very important question. Uh, I mean, the Central African Republic is a little bit unique because it has a very weak civil society. Um, so you don't have kind of the human, local human rights groups that we work with in many other countries and that we su support. Uh, but we did find some really important partners um, in the Central African Republic, especially within the church, um, local priests who opened up their churches to safeguard people um, and who put their lives on the line um, to make sure that the killers wouldn't come and commit massacres. Um, so we worked very closely with them. And actually, um, e every year we honor somebody at our annual dinner. Um, and this year it will be a priest from the Central African Republic. Um, and we also got them resources to be able to do their work better. Um, their ambulance was stolen in one place and we got their ambulance back. We got them a new ambulance. But you know, in most of the countries we work with, it would be completely impossible for us to operate on the ground and collect this kind of information uh, without our local partners. The local human rights activists, um, the local journalists, um, just the whole community of people um, who take much greater risks than we do um, to expose what is happening in their countries. And that civil society is under attack in many parts of the world, uh, from Russia to many Asian countries, um, really all across the board. Um, we see a, a very powerful crackdown on civil society. I mean, in Egypt, you can be thrown in jail for 10 years right now um, just for attending a protest. And many of our close collaborators are now in prison. Um, so it also is a very important part of our work to um, work to defend their work um, and also to help them get out of their countries and seek safety abroad sometimes uh, when they're forced to flee. Um, that's a very important responsibility we carry. Um, should I go ahead? Okay. Yes. Uh, my question is basically about um, what the social media response was um, to, to this. I work in a similar industry, so when we're talking about um, social media specifically, I feel like for issues uh, from C like CAR related, it's harder to uh, gen create an audience around these issues on social media, probably easier when you're pushing it out to broadcasters or to an audience that's already interested in, uh, in CAR. So were you able to build an audience, uh, create, you know, find new followers, subscribers, and what is your, for Human Rights Watch, what kind of success metric do you have for social media, I know your ultimate goal is sort of policy change, advocacy, but also what do you consider a success on social media? So we actually coined uh, the hashtag car crisis. Um, I mean, car by itself wouldn't have worked very well um, on Twitter. Um, and it, it was adopted by almost everybody who was talking about cars. So journalists, the humanitarian community, the diplomats. Um, and I wasn't even really on Twitter before the, I started working in CAR, and I went up to like 20,000 followers in less than a year, and was named one of the um, top 140 people on Twitter by Time Magazine, um, which came as a real surprise. Um, so it did have impact, and the real impact it had was that when the chief of staff of the French army flew into Bangui um, on his last assignment before um, his retirement, a friend of mine was on the plane uh, with him. He was a journalist. And he said that the whole time over, they were talking about Le Tweet, the Human Rights Watch, um, and how you know we were exposing everything they were doing wrong in the Central African Republic. So um, I think it had some real impact. Um, even Anonymous joined our campaign to draw attention to the Central African Republic, uh, which was pretty cool. But yeah. I'm sure um, Carol will want to talk a little also, bit about Also, I think we, we kind of have many different layers and levels of it because, uh, of course, there's a Twitter campaign going on, but there's an Instagram campaign. And, and, and you know, f I have some followers on Instagram, but I'm also, I also work with National Geographic and they have now 22 million followers on Instagram, and that was an extraordinary powerful tool for National Geographic to allow us to post what was going on directly from the Central African Republic onto their Instagram account. And they were running a Storyfy um, um, piece on their website that was updating automatically with everything that was going on from not just Peter and myself, but 
from other journalists that were using the car crisis hashtag. And so we had many different social media platforms that were trying to engage in many different ways. And when you know that, as you say, the Minister of Defense starts following you on Twitter or you know, the, the, the son of the ex-dictator starts following you on Instagram, then you know that you're gonna have impact and people are listening. And, but also, you know, it's kind, of, it's kind of an interesting question because I've thought quite deeply about what would have happened. We were doing this reporting at an extraordinarily significant anniversary, the Rwandan genocide, 1994. What would have happened in 1994 if we would have had social media in Rwanda. And, and this is something I've thought about quite deeply. And I think that if we'd have had social media in Rwanda, we would not have had the significant level of genocide that we had. And actually, what would have happened in CAR if we didn't have social media? And if we didn't have the handful of activists and journalists that were working there? We would have had another Rwanda. I'm sure of it, because it was not on the radar the French were not acting. No one was being. No one was pushing anyone to intervene. And I'm absolutely certain, instead of the thousands, of, tens of thousands of people killed, it would have been in the hundreds of thousands of people killed in Central African Republic. And that is because of social media. Um, I just want to tell one little story. I think in the one of the clips about the media, you saw the image of the starving boy with the very emaciated arm. Uh, we found him. His name is Yusufa. Um, and we found him this January in a camp called Yaloke, which is a Muslim enclave that they were unable to leave, starving to death. Um, and we took that picture and we tweeted it. And that same day, the, um, the Deputy Secretary General um, of the UN uh, saw the picture and ha asked his assistant to call me and figure out what was happening in Yaloke. We had tried for months and months to draw attention to what was happening there. Um, but that picture went straight to the top of the UN. And that's when they decided to actually do something about these hundreds of people who were starving. Um, and they ultimately um, got the community evacuated to safety in Cameroon. Um, sadly, Yusufa died from starvation um, a few days later. Um, yeah. I think the mic is up in the middle. Mm -hmm. so, oh. I've had the opportunity to work with the uh, Burmese Political Prisoners Association in Thailand and also the Tibetan Political Prisoners Association in India. And one of the things that I've learned from that experience is that these organizations are designed not only to serve as advocates, but in many ways to serve as buffers or, or to insulate their members from journalists and filmmakers that, that come to town who often don't have a lot of experience uh, in dealing with the nature of their trauma. And so I'm just curious, we, we've talked about safety and dignity of the subjects and also about training. So I'm just curious as, as a, either a researcher or as a filmmaker, uh, what type of protocols do you use or training have you gone through to, to make sure that the work that you're doing is not re-traumatizing uh, to the subjects that you're, that you're advocating for? But, I mean, Peter's a researcher and I'm not. Let me just say quickly that it's a super important question. I think the, the main guiding principle is that the subject controls the interview. That you're, you're never pushing someone to tell you something. You're constantly asking if they're comfortable going on. You're, um, you're not forcing them to tell you anything. You're, you're really putting them in the driver's seat. It, it is always incredible to me how much people want to tell their story. And people who have undergone extraordinary trauma want to talk about it. I find that extremely moving. And there's no question that they do it because they want justice and they want the world to know. And they see you as someone who will tell the world and help to create justice. And sometimes we have to really try to manage people's expectations about what we realistically think we can achieve. But more often than not, people want to talk. And, um, and they often say, use my name, go ahead, tell the whole world it was me who saw him kill my father. You know, and we're like, no, actually, we're not gonna use your name. Sometimes we're even more protective of people's identities than they are themselves. But you're right that 
we have to be extremely careful about not re trauma we, you know, when we're talking to people who are victims of sexual violence. A lot of work goes into training and preparing Human Rights Watch researchers to conduct that very, very delicate interview. And also, I think, in the field, if you think logistically, we work with similar organizations. So we're not, very rarely, actually, do we go and knock on somebody's shoulder on the street and say, can you tell me our story? We're going through these organizations, these gatekeepers as well. And that could be the church, or it could be a priest, or it could be an imam, or it could be local human rights organization who has told us the story and, and has said this person wants to tell their story. And so the logistics of it are that we work very much in advance of the interview. So if we're sitting somebody down in front of a camera, there are many hours of work that have gone on before that, before we sit them down in front of a camera and take their testimony in that particular point. It could be days or hours before that we've, you know, we've sat down and we've discussed as a group, as individuals, what it was, what, what is the story, and and what it is that they want to share. So the logistics of it is we work in a very similar way to that to those groups. Yeah, I I have the unfortunate experience of having a mother who's a psychologist. So, um, it, <laughs> oh, it, it is something that I'm very aware of, and you know. You have to understand that in the places we work, um, the the telling of a person's experience is oftentimes the only time that they're going to have the opportunity to tell their story. Um, because oftentimes within their community, it's just not done. Um, so it can be a very important kind of affirming experience for them. Uh, if it's done properly, and if they get given the choice whether they want to tell their story and in a safe environment, and given the time to tell their story the way they want to tell it. I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's really horrific sometimes how people kind of hurry witnesses, victims along to try to tell their story because, you know, they want to get a couple interviews in for the day. And that's really not what we're about. And also, at the end of the interview, um, you have to have a closing process. You have to acknowledge what people went through. Um, and oftentimes we stay in touch. I mean, you know, all of these people that you saw in these video clips are people that we interacted with and that we checked in on and that oftentimes we continue to check in on. So I have to, I, I have one piece of bad news and two pieces of good news. I'm sorry to interrupt. The bad news is we do have to stop in here, um, but I think the good news is that if people are willing to walk over just to the gallery space, we can continue talking. And I just wanna be sure to mention, as you can see on this slide, our hashtag HRWFF and then our handle at HRW Film Festival. We love it if people continue talking on Twitter slash Instagram about the conversation here. And I also would say that people should definitely stop outside. We have our email sign up list as well as a survey it's a great way to stay in touch, and you can also learn more about this program if you want. The other piece of good news is that we have one more clip, um, which is, I'm gonna dare say happy clip that Marcus kindly shared, and we're gonna play that as a closing for everyone, and then, I, like I said, I would welcome you to come across the hall and continue talking, but Ted, if we can do clip five, we're gonna wrap with that, and thank you all so much for being here, and thank you three so much. Thank you.